while you're getting settled, um, I'll just introduce my, uh, myself. I'm Jennifer Chan. I'm a pathologist and a scientist and the deputy director of the Charbonneau Cancer Institute at the University of Calgary. And um, I'll also be your host this evening for, uh, for our event. Uh, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to Cancer 101. This is part of the late night lab at Studio Bell that we're, uh, we're hoping to start, or we are starting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see all of you here. Um, there's like some really good energy in the room, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll learn something and, and want to come back for, for next time. So hopefully you've had a chance to explore earlier on um, the science demonstrations and chat with some of our trainees. You can, you can tell that there are trainees that are wearing the late night lab uh, t-shirts, you can spot them. Um, and if you haven't, you, know, you can uh, check out their displays afterwards. Um, but at this point in the evening, what we'll do is we'll move into the uh, more formal talks. So tonight is the first in a series of public lectures that we plan to host. Uh, so that you'll get a taste of what uh, cancer research is all about, you know, some of the broad concepts in cancer research, um, and so that we can share with you what we are doing um, locally at the Charbonneau Cancer Institute. Um, <clears throat> tonight, you're going to hear from three uh, of our uh, investigators, Dr. Darren Brenner, Dr. Paula Neri, and Dr. Doug Mahoney, uh, each working in different areas of cancer research, in cancer prevention and risk uh, reduction, in precision cancer therapy, and in cancer immunotherapy. And then in future events, uh, so today's just kind of like a, a taster, an, an appetizer. Um, in future events, you'll have the opportunity to dive, delve deeper into some of these topics and even other topics um, so that we can continue to share with you what, what we do in cancer research. So um, before we begin, some, uh, some acknowledgments. So I'll take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, uh, Region 3. Uh, at the Charbonneau Cancer Institute, our postdocs, our postdoctoral fellows, and our graduate students, they're, they're key in our institute. Um, they play an important role in enabling our research, and they actually represent, these are truly the future of uh, medical science. Um, I'd like to thank the Charbonneau Trainee Association uh, for helping us host this event and run the demonstrations. Uh, special thanks also to uh, a couple of our trainees in particular, Myra Chen, over there, uh, Dan Berger, right in the front, uh, next to Myra, and Daniel Bozek over here, um, for their help with planning and facilitating the event. I'd also like to acknowledge our institute director, Dr. Gregory Karen Cross, right over there, who just waved. You can wave behind you, yes. Um, <clears throat> who works tirelessly to support uh, and advocate for cancer research throughout the cancer research continuum, all the way from prevention, to treatment, to survivorship, to end-of-life care. So uh, before we begin, uh, finally, I have a few housekeeping uh, notes here. Uh, there are a lot of people in the audience. If you could um, put your phones to ring, uh, not to ring, the opposite, put your ringers on vibrate. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, and then uh, also in this public lecture series, we're here to discuss um, big ideas about cancer and to share our work with you. Uh, it really isn't set up very well to um, dispense individual medical advice, so for that, please um, go, go talk to your oncologist. If you have some other pressing issues, you know, we can have some informal conversation later on, but uh, this forum really isn't set up for um, dispensing individual medical advice. Um, and then uh, lastly, after our presentations, what we'll do is we'll, we'll each give uh, a few minutes on what we do. I'll give an overview followed by the three talks. Um, at the end of the talks, we'll all gather and we'll, we'll be up here to field questions from the audience. Um, so we'll hold the questions till the end. <clears throat> and then after that, we'll have an opportunity to, if you didn't get a chance to check out the um, demonstrations, there's uh, extra time at the end to chat with us and to uh, visit the, the demos a little bit more. Okay, so welcome. Okay, so these are guys, you'll see them later. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna give the first part. Uh, I'm gonna ease you into cancer research. Um, and basically, I'll, I'll just answer this question. I hope to answer this question just very um, generally for you. What is cancer? Okay, so for many of us, cancer, we think of cancer and we think of a mass. Right. It's, it's some mass, it shouldn't be there, you know, and it occur, can occur in different organs, right? It could occur a mass in the lung, a mass in the liver. So we think of that when, when we think of cancer often. 
Um, but when I think of cancer, um, I think of cancer as an altered version of our normal selves. And what I mean by that is cancer isn't this entirely foreign thing. Um, cancer bears similarity to normal tissues in your body, just like this painting. So, you know, I'm not saying that uh, Picasso is cancer, but <laughs> I'm saying that it shares some similarities. So if you look at this, at this uh, artwork by, by Picasso, you'll see that, okay, I can instantly recognize that this person, this is, oh, that this is supposed to be a person, right? It bears some similarity to a, a girl, a, a female. And you can see that you know, there's an arm and there's a head, but it's something is not quite right. So this isn't reality, right? There's something altered with reality. Um, so it's recognizable, but it's not entirely what I would say normal. So if this person walked into the room, you would say that's not quite normal. So as a pathologist, so I'm a pathologist by training, um, this is sort of reinforced every day when I look at slides and, and I, I look at sort of images of cancer. Um, in this slide, what you're seeing is um, an image, a microscopic image of colon cancer. Um, what you're seeing on the left is um, normal colon tissue. So these are normal cells, they're growing glands, you know, they're making all the nice little uh, mucin and things that secrete into your colon. And in the, on the right, this is what colonic adenocarcinoma looks like. And so this is what I mean by cancer is just kind of like an altered version of our normal cells. These cancer cells, they still try to recapitulate what the normal tissue is doing. They're still trying in some way to make a gland structure. They're still trying in a way to line up like they normally would, but they're not doing it very well. And furthermore, not only are they continuing to proliferate in making these abnormal glands, they're doing it in an area where they should not be, right? So there should be no glands past, you know, this is sort of this special line of demarcation. There shouldn't be any glands down here. So what they've done is they've acquired some properties, but these are not abnormal properties. So the properties of growth, of proliferation, um, these are normal things that we do normally when we develop, right, from, from babies to, to adults. Um, they also die, and there are cells that die all the time, so you know, our normal cells all the time, die all the time, but these ones are, are kind of doing it in a dysregulated way. So um, we've recognized this kind of picture as cancer for a long time, just by looking down the microscope. But the main question, I think the question for us as researchers is, what makes those well-behaved cells, those ones that are nice and orderly and kind of like, doing their own, they're the right thing, right? They're behaving. What turns them into a wild mess? Like, turns them into worse than hockey fans after a Stanley Cup loss? Like, this is, this is our question. Like, what would dysregulate the cells? And so this is what we're trying to sort out when we're, we're doing cancer research. So to answer that question, um, I'll just introduce you to, you know, so the molecular basis of, I guess, life <laughs> uh, or, or cancer, which is also about life. Um, so each cell in our body, what regulates it to do certain things, to behave certain ways, to become the cell that it is, is based in the instructions that the cell carries. Uh, and this set of instructions, it's a huge set of instructions, it's like a library, it comes with a library of instructions. And if you want to make a cell and make a cell behave normally, you'd follow a series of of some of the instructions, some of the recipes in this compendium of recipes, right? So all your recipe books, and you'd make all the molecules that make up the cell, you'd make all the molecules that say, okay, grow or stop growing, you know, all the signals that tell it how to behave. So if you do that right, you know, you wanna make some protein, and then you're gonna follow the instructions and you're gonna end up with some nice protein in the end, something that you want to happen. Okay, so that's an example, but in reality, so that's one of, of all of these recipe books. In reality, our recipe books, these protocols, they're, they're riddled with typos and errors. Um, and some of, those, some of those errors, they could be maybe inconsequential. Let's say you lose a space between two paragraphs where there are like, you know, two returns or something. You know, who, who cares, right? You're still gonna follow the recipe. You're still gonna make a protein in the end. It's still gonna be totally functional. Yeah, you know, not such a big deal. Um, so some alterations in these, these typos, these errors, um, maybe are inconsequential. Others, you can imagine, okay, you're following a recipe and it's supposed to say something like, you know, bake at 350 for, you know, 30 minutes and it says now 
bake at 650 for 30 minutes, now you can see, you know, you could have kind of disastrous consequences. So you could really affect how the downstream protein or molecule is behaving. And that downstream protein or molecule be, could be saying, okay, keep growing when you're not supposed to be growing. So some of those errors, actually, I didn't really mean to do that. I'll just, I'll just keep going. So some of those errors, um, so I said it's riddled with these errors, right? You have all of these changes all throughout all of these recipe books. Some of those changes kind of occur right at the time that the book is coming off the press, right? So you're basically inheriting those errors, you know, when, when, you, when that cell starts to exist. Others of those errors are ones that you accumulate over time. So um, let's say in a highly used part of the book, you know, you're reading a lot and some pages get ripped out, right? Or you're reading a lot and you spill some coffee on there. So there could be many, many reasons why you accumulate these errors. Again, some come with you, right? You're, you inherit some and some are kind of um, just a product of uh, wear and tear throughout your life. So um, just to bring it back to cancer, no, we're not talking about cupcakes or fire or anything like that. We're talking about the cancer and the cancer genome. So this library of books is really like the totality of all your genes um, that your cell contains, and that's contained in the nucleus. We call that the genome. And the genome, the words in these books, um, that would be written in DNA. So all the DNA, and there are errors in the DNA. And again, like those books, there are typos and errors scattered all the way throughout, and those, Typos, those little errors, are cumulatively what will cause a cell not to behave the way it's supposed to behave. So one, one thing to know too is that it doesn't take just one error to kind of make a cell go wonky. It takes a combination of errors. Um, so you have to have a, maybe three, maybe a handful of errors to have cellular dysregulation. So here you can see okay, well that cell now has, has grown, it's starting to invade, it's doing things it shouldn't do, the cells look a little bit funny, just like the, the cells that we saw earlier on. Um, but the other thing to recognize is that, you know, so far I've talked all about the cancer cell, like the cell that has gone rogue, um, but the other thing to recognize is it doesn't go rogue alone, it interacts with the cells that are nearby, right? So everything exists in its environment. Um, so here are the cancer cells, but there are also um, immune cells, there are other stromal cells, normal body cells, and these interactions are very important in whether this thing grows or doesn't grow or becomes malignant, you know, all, all of these things, how, how it responds to therapy. So the cancer and its microenvironment is a, is a very important facet of cancer biology. And then furthermore, it's not just in its microenvironment, each cancer exists in the patient or in the human, and that particular person might respond differently to how that cancer you know, grows or doesn't grow or responds or doesn't respond. And then finally, um, each of us, um, you know, I said you know, part of it's inherited and part of it is acquired, right, in terms of these errors, these mutations. Um, each of us has a, a certain cancer risk, right? The things that we do carry certain risk. Our genetic background carries certain risk exposures. And so understanding cancer in the population at a population level is also very important in um, understanding what drives and you know, how we respond and what we should do about the cancer problem. So I think that's my very brief overview. Um, uh, I wanna say at this point, we'll turn it over to the individual speakers. Um, Dr. Darren Brenner will talk about cancer in the pop at a population level, the risk, who's getting it, what are the trends. Um, Dr. Paula Neri will talk about whether we can harness the information which genes are altered, right? Which alterations they are to better predict and better target uh, specific cancers to kind of rein in their growth. And then finally, um, we'll conclude the evening with Dr. Doug Mahoney, who will talk about um, the importance of these other cells that are not the cancer cells, maybe immune cells, maybe other cells, in how um, our bodies can, um, I guess, control or be taught to control um, the growth of a particular cancer. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Dr. Darren Brenner. I'm coming into that one. So this, uh, this evening I'm gonna be talking about the burden of cancer in Canada. And I'm gonna do this from the population level. 
And as part of that, I'll be providing some really high level numbers, some large statistics around what is the cumulative burden of cancer in Canada. Some of these numbers are gonna come across as very, very large in the tens and hundreds of thousands of cancer cases. What I want you to remember is that within those big numbers, every single cancer case is impactful, is important. Because while we'll be talking about the population level burden of cancer, really the burden of cancer is, it's personal. It's our families, it's our parents, it's our friends, it's our siblings, it's our community. So while I'll be speaking about this population level burden, remember that every single data point matters and is impactful. So when I'll show some graphs about a rate going up or down, while sometimes it might not seem like that dramatic of a change, every single time that curve goes up or down, it's a person, it's a family that doesn't have to go through a cancer journey. So I just want to start with that sort of a frame. So I'm a cancer epidemiologist at the Charbonneau Cancer Institute. And as a cancer epidemiologist, my goal and what I try to do is understand these big questions. Who gets cancer in the population? So how common is cancer in the population? When do people in their lives get cancer? When do they get cancer both uh, in their own life and over time? Whereabouts in the body does that cancer occur? Does that vary geographically? And something we're really invested in at the Charbonneau is addressing these next two questions of why do some people get cancer? And perhaps most importantly, what can we do to either prevent it, screen it, or treat that cancer? So we're gonna to try to just touch on a very high level all of these questions in the next few minutes with some data showing the population level burden of cancer in Canada. So the first question is often asked, how common is cancer in Canada? So it is a major, major driver of negative health consequences in Canada. So at this point, about one in two Canadians are expected to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. And last year, over 200,000 Canadians were diagnosed with cancer. And so the question's often raised, well, is this getting worse in the population? We hear more stories of our neighbors, our friends, our family being diagnosed with cancer. Is this getting worse? And the answer is actually no. We're getting better at preventing cancer. So there's success and there's positive news coming forward. So I'll show some graphs that look like this. Any of these figures that are shown in blue represent the rates among men. Any graphs shown in red are, represent the rates among females. And so this shows two pieces of data. The bars are the total numbers of cancer cases. All of these graphs from the left-hand side is older data and the more current data is on the right. And so you'll notice that while the total number is going up, that's just because the population of Canada is getting bigger. We have more people coming to Canada and more people growing their families within Canada. But what I really want you to focus on is that line at the top. That is the rate of cancer in Canada among men. And you'll see that's been relatively stable over time. We're really starting to make progress towards the current time of dropping that line forward, trying to prevent cancer and reduce the burden at the population level. So it isn't actually increasing. We're doing a better job at preventing. And the way to interpret a rate is, if you took every single one of these years, you took 100,000 people out of the population and you counted how many of those people were diagnosed with cancer, you could compare that over time and know if that rate's getting more common or less common in the population. But if we look at that from the collective perspective of all cancer as one disease, we're really masking a lot of stories within a story. So cancer is actually a collection of diseases. So every cancer site has a different story, has a different outcome. And so when we look at this graph, each one of these bars represents a different cancer site. And so when you look at the middle line, that's your baseline. Anything on the left-hand side that's above that middle line, that cancer site's getting more common in Canada. Anything on the right where it's below that middle line, it's getting less common. So I'll give two examples just to show how we look at these data. So for example, lung cancer in Canada for the past few years has been declining, but kidney cancer, shown here in this box, has been going up. Uh, rates of kidney cancer have been going up for the last 10 to 20 years. And I'll tell you a little bit about these two stories. So this looks similar to the graph I showed before. Focus on the lines at the top. These are your cancer rates. And so the change in these lines are what's happening at the population level. And again, the rates among men are shown on the top in blue and on the bottom shown in, uh, among women. 
And there's been a huge amount of progress at the individual level, at the practice level, and at the policy level in reducing the exposure to tobacco in Canada. And this has had a dramatic impact, as you can see, on lung cancer rates over time. And in our group, we're really focused on what's going to happen in the future if we act today. And we project out on the second half of this graph. So the darker colors are data up until the present time, and the lighter colors are when we use models to project forward. And we see that the future is brighter in that we're going to have continued success in reducing the burden of tobacco in the population. And so the rates of lung cancer are going to continue to drop, uh, particularly for among males, and then uh, in the, further in the future among females. And this is a very contradictory story to kidney cancer. And so if you look back here, the furthest on the left, this is back in the 1980s and carrying forward into the middle points in the 20 teens, you can see there's been a consistent rise in the rates of kidney cancer in Canada. And when we project forward over the next 30 years, this is going to continue. And why is this? This is because the number one driving factor for kidney cancer is excess body size. So as the average weight of Canadians goes up over time, this increases the baseline risk for kidney cancer in the population. And this is projected to continue to increase. So these two examples of lung cancer and kidney cancer should show that what we do and how we interact with our world, as Dr. Chan mentioned, can have an impact on that risk of cancer and that rate and burden of cancer. So the question is, well, can we actually cure cancer? It's often asked when we're walking around, we say, hey, I'm a scientist, can we cure cancer? So I said, well, what do you mean? Like, like, it really matters, what, what do you mean by cure cancer? Do you, do you mean, can we stop it from ever even starting in the first place? And we refer to that as primary cancer prevention. So stopping exposure from ever happening along this cancer development continuum, all the way from the first exposure that increases your risk, to that first genetic damage in your DNA, to that point when just a few cells are cancerous in the body, to the point when in the clinic they'll be detected and treated by your oncology team. So if you're coming back to that first question, if that's what you're really interested in, yes we can. That's what we call primary prevention and we focus on risk reduction strategies like reducing our exposure to radon or smoking, excess body size in the population. Or if your question is, well what if at that really, really early point on in cancer when it's just a few cells in the body, can we prevent that? Well, absolutely, and we do that here in Alberta through secondary prevention, also known as cancer screening, which we'll talk a little bit about in just a minute. And lastly, in the perhaps the more uh, conventional sense of the word cure, can we treat and prevent a recurrence once a tumor actually develops? And this relates to how we treat and focus on survivorship post-diagnosis for cancer. So I'll just touch briefly on each of these questions to say, yes, we can, we have made progress, and we have quite an active areas of research in each of these areas at the Charbonneau. Starting with this concept of primary prevention. So I already mentioned the lung cancer story, and I'll just reiterate. So this is the rate of lung cancer in males in Canada between the ages of 60 and 70, going back from 1970 all the way to 2014. And you'll see that there was a dramatic increase in the rate of lung cancer up until about the mid-1980s. And then it started to go down because of this. So this is the rate of smoking prevalence, active smoking prevalence among men in Canada. Back in the 1960s, one in two Canadians, 50% of Canadians used to actively smoke cigarettes on a daily basis. And through individual level change, practice change, and policy change, you can see that's gone down almost to 15% now, and that looks very similar in that line of the decrease in lung cancer rates over time. So certainly we can act in this primary prevention. And in our research group, in partnership with a group at Alberta Health Services, we're actively engaged in what are the other factors that we can use to primary prevention of cancer. And so we, I mentioned as well the kidney cancer story, and we can see the opposite story here of where the rates are going up, and this relates largely to, as I mentioned, excess body size in the population going up. And what I wanted to highlight in this slide is that this is uniform across age groups. So in the older age groups, the middle age, as well as the very young, we still see this increase in risk and increase in rates over time. And so in our group, we're very much interested in what else is driving cancer risk in the population and what can we do to try to prevent cancer. 
And so we embarked on a four-year journey that was called the, Com the COMPARE Project, the Canadian Population Attributable Risk Project. We've just recently finished some of this work that really worked at a national level as well as in Alberta to estimate how, what is the preventable fraction of cancer? What can we do to prevent cancer? And so this is for each cancer site, each bar represents a cancer site with the most common cancers on the left and the least common cancers on the right. And when you look within a cancer site, the more of that bar that's colored in, the higher the preventable fraction or more of that cancer can be prevented through either changes in our lifestyle, in the environment and how we interact with it, and our interactions with various infections. And you'll note that for things like lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, some very common cancers in Canada, there's a very large attributable proportion, up to 85, 90% sometimes. When we look at this, um, and if anyone's in, more interested in these data, you can certainly go to our website at prevent.cancer.ca, where we've been working with the Canadian Cancer Society on lots more of the messaging around these uh, preventable factors for cancer. And at the actual number level, how many cancers in Canada could we potentially prevent going forward into the future? We estimate that over 70,000 cancer cases per year could be prevented if we could take action at the individual, the practice, and the policy level to change exposure to these environmental, lifestyle, and infectious factors in Canada. And again, if you're interested, prevent.cancer.ca. So just to highlight two of the factors we looked at this project and how what we do can change the cancer risk and can change the cancer burden in the Canadian population. So looking at human papillomavirus, HPV. So we know that HPV causes six cancer types. We know this. We estimate that about 4,000 cancer cases per year are due to previous HPV infection. But we also know that we have a vaccine for HPV. We modeled forward into the future over the next 30 years, and if we could get school-aged children up to the vaccination rates that are recommended by Health Canada, we could prevent over 5,000 young women from being diagnosed with cervical cancer over the next 30 years. That's more than one per high school in Canada, almost two people per high school. So action we could take to, to prevent cancer going forward into the future. One more example that's a little bit more broadly applicable to everyone in the population. We also know that physical activity reduces your risk of many cancer sites, including breast and colon, which are very common cancers in Canada. But we also know that about seven in 10 Canadians are not getting their recommended 30 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous activity. But if we can take action together over the next 30 years, we could potentially prevent over 25,000 cancer cases from occurring. So from what I show, we know that we can prevent some cancers, but not all cancers are preventable. So sometimes we buy a cookbook, going back to our analogy of our recipes, and there's already a printing error. We can't do anything about that. But there is something we can do in terms of secondary prevention. So once a cancer's already occurred at a very small level, we can act through screening programs. We have multiple screening programs in Alberta that have impacted already to reduce the cancer burden in Alberta and in Canada. I'll just show two examples. One is colorectal cancer. So these are the rates of colorectal cancer in Canada among men 55 to 65, going back from 1969 to 2012. And so you can see the rate was climbing up, 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 up. And then collectively as a clinical community, they decided to implement endoscopic-based screening or everyone's favorite colonoscopies which then plateaued the rates and they started dropping down. And now they've paired this test with fecal-based testing, which increases the sensitivity and specificity of screening programs. And now the rates continue to drop. So active engagement in colorectal screening has reduced the rates of colon cancer in, in Alberta and in Canada. One more example, when we talk about curing cancer, a very powerful example is cervical cancer. So this is the rate of cervical cancer among women aged 50 to 59 in Canada. And you can see that since the early 1970s, those rates have dropped dramatically. And this is because of the implementation of population-based screening with pap testing. We know that cervical cancer is caused by HPV. We know we can vaccinate, and we can also implement HPV DNA testing for screening, which would effectively cure 
cervical cancer from the population. We can actually use the term eradicate, that eventually the future is a cervical cancer-free Canada. And so we know that we can prevent some cancer, but not all cancers can be prevented. We can screen for some cancers, but not all cancers can be screened for yet. So sometimes we will have to focus on tertiary prevention. What do we do for those patients that show up in clinic in terms of improving their outcomes and treatment and, and survivorship? And so in these cases, currently about one in four Canadians will die of cancer. In 2018, about 80,000 Canadians died due to a cancer-related death. But the rates of survival are improving dramatically. Over the last 30 years, for males, they've, been, they've decreased. So after being diagnosed with a, a cancer, your risk of dying has dropped by 30% for males and 20% for females. And this is largely driven by the advances in treatment, which we're going to hear about from our next two speakers. And about 60% of Canadians are alive five years after their diagnosis, which is a really positive statistic. The prime determinant of your survival journey is where that cancer is diagnosed. And so this comes back to that story that it's not just one cancer, cancer is a collection of diseases. And this just shows the four most common cancers in Canada. Blue on top, prostate cancer among males, green female breast cancer, and then colorectal and lung cancer among males and females combined. And you can see that at one year, three years, five years, and 10 years from survival, they're very different journeys, very different experiences based on where that cancer occurred. So it's definitely not one journey, it's one a collection of different diseases and journeys. And even for these more uh, fatal cancers, we'll learn later tonight that the future is actually quite bright with advances in treatment that are coming uh, through scientific breakthroughs and discoveries. So lastly, in this group for uh, the treatment and survivorship phase, really the goal is to try to find the best treatments and the best survivorship-based activities to reduce the treatment-related burden and try to reduce uh, prevent the likelihood of a cancer recurrence and a subsequent mortality event. So I hope that I've sort of from a very high level, the population level, address some of these questions around who, how common is cancer, when it happens in our ages, that it's very different across cancer sites, and perhaps addressing the most important questions that we're working on at the Charbonneau, why do some people get cancer, and what we can do to potentially improve prevention, screening, and as we'll hear from our next two speakers, uh, in terms of improving treatment outcomes. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. First, I would like to thank Jen and Greg for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. And um, I'm a physician scientist, physician at the Tom Baker. Hi, my expertise is multiple myeloma, which is a disease of is a blood cancer. And I'm a scientist at the um, Charbonneau. So my topic will be, I know, and be ready, a bit more challenging. Uh, but with me, I'll try to simplify, although is a bit more um, difficult in a way. But I will go over what we think and what really the excitement uh, of the precision oncology is, where we are and where we are going with this. So let me start with the treatment option for cancer patients. We all know that we can divide them into big group. We have local option as well as systemic option. For local, we intend mainly surgery, radiation therapy. And when we say local, it's because really they go just in the area where the cancer is growing, so they don't affect any other part of the body. But when we talk about systemic therapy, and this can be by um, an IV infusion, can be by oral pills, these are more, these are, they include hormonal therapy and chemotherapy, and they are systemic because they affect not only the cancer cells, but affect also the normal cells. Now, if we put them in a, uh, in a scale and we think of them as a pillars of the cancer treatment, we, all, we have three standard pillars. In the, in the center, you can see in blue the surgery that for thousands, thousands years have been used to treat patients with cancer. We have to wait really until the late 1800 to really have radiation be available for cancer patients. Radiation is basically the use of heavy or high energy particles to really to 
destroy the cancer cells. And chemotherapy, which we are all familiar with, came available for cancer patients in the late 1900s. But a very high breakthrough, and I will say the very excitement you are going to hear tonight will be from me. It's regarding the precision therapy and from Dr. Maoni after me about immunotherapy. These are without a doubt are really the next generation of cancer therapy. And this will be the focus of my presentation, specific precision therapy. So first of all, let me define what precision therapy is. With this term, we really uh, define the use of drugs that this time they're really going after and they are going to target, therefore destroy only the cancer cells, avoiding all the side effects that unfortunately chemotherapy is well known to cause because they're, again, they are going after just the tumor cells. But how this is possible? What really made this important progress? In 2001, finally, the first human genome was described, was published, and we got very excited about that. So remember the book that Dr. Chen showed you at the beginning, the book containing all the information important for our body is actually contained on the genome. And the first time we kind of learn how, what it is, what are the letters included was back in 2001. Just to give you a comparison, took 13 years to have that draft, cost $3 billion to have that information. And today, uh, I'll show you some example. We can do this test for uh, in few hours, first of all, not years, few hours, it costs probably two to three thousand dollars. So we're really the advance of the technology, no doubt, is there. But this is how the reason why I'm showing you this picture. This is the cover page of Nature, which for uh, for scientists really is our high level and high impact factor journal. Is that is saying the future is bright? We all knew that with this piece of information, we can really learn much more about diseases, about cancer, and so on. Because, as we show, as uh, Dr. Chan showed you earlier, we can finally open this book where all our information are and be able to read it and really understand what went wrong in the speci specific patient at a certain time. So one piece of information that came from really this important work was really learning that cancer is the disease of the genome. But what is genome? I'll try to simplify. So the genome, think about like really this book or the genetic material that all individual has. And it's so important and so, uh, and highly preserved because really contain all the information that made who we are. It is uh, actually located, if you look at the cells in that cartoon, is inside the cells in an area called nucleus and contain three billion of letters, really long, long sequence, long frequency of letter. They are organized in what we call chromosome. We have each of us 46 chromosome organized in 23 pairs. But why is important? Because from this, the, this sequence of letter is really formed what we call the genes. And each gene contains the instruction to make protein, and the protein is really what makes cells to function. So if something goes wrong in this sequence, we can understand how things can become a bit more complicated. I'll give you an example. Um, so we know, for example, now that cancer may, may actually result from a sim sim simple change of a sequence. If you look in the top, this is, uh, yeah, here we go. So this is in a normal cell. So you have in this gene, this sequence, CTT, the simple, the simple replacement of a T with an A, so a CAT, is able actually to cause a change on the protein that these cells produce. And if this actually happens in a gene that is extremely important for the growth of the cells, these normal cells can become abnormal and can actually trigger cancer. And as you, you learn from my other speaker before me that sometimes you may, the cause of these changes can be different, can be due to environmental factors, can be due to spontaneous factors, also can be inherited. Now, why is it so important to uh, study the genome, so really inside the cells? Because we know when we treat patients with cancer, every tumor is too different, every cancer patient is different. If I think about my clinic, 
I can treat 10 patients with the same drug. Each of them will have a different response. Each of them, in each of them, the response will last differently. So it's not that simple just to, um, we need to have more information to predict how each of them can do. And therefore, we really think that the genomic study can give this information, can really under, tell us what is driving that tumor in that specific patient, can identify eventually a target. What I mean by that, if exactly what went wrong in that case, and then have a tr drug for it. And lastly, it will be probably the right way to do what we do, we think about personalized therapy, meaning look at the genetic makeup of our cells and find the right drug for that specific case. To give an analogy, and um, uh, thank you guys for suggesting the cars, hopefully the message is given is more clear. So if you think of the cars like the cells, from the outside, what we can tell is simply they are different color. So we have red, blue cars, meaning we have just from the look, we can have, they have, they are different, but not that much. And then I will say all the red, all the red car are the same cells, so let's treat them in the same way. But I can tell you some, some of these red cells can, be, uh, can actually be treated in a certain way, but maybe they don't respond to all to the same therapy. Why? Because we really need to go inside the cells, open the car, and look what exactly went wrong in the specific case, in the specific patient, to act on it. Because sometimes it can be a problem on the brake, sometimes it can be a problem in the oil. So we need to have that information. So we have, and now, we have tools to go deep inside the cells and understand what exactly exactly went wrong. So with this in mind, um, we have created the Charbonneau A Cancer Genomic Unit. And this is really through the support that Greg and all the institute give us, as well as some large donation that support group and donors have given it to to all of us. And um, I don't know if you have the, if you had the uh, opportunity to tour the lab, but these are the three big, big sequencers we have in the space. And I'll show you what the sequencers are, but they are really top cut edge uh, technology that we have available in our routine, in our lab. And what we also have, not only the, the instrument, but we have tissue bank, so that we have collect over time tissue bank for different kinds of cancer, and of course the capability now to, uh, to, do, to perform a different genomic study. But um, you may ask, what is this sequencer? So these are really, it's true, very expensive instrument, but I kind of um, uh, alluded to earlier, what they do, they finally open the book, they are able to read all the sequence, all the letter, and really understand in every individual patient what, what is the sequence, what went wrong, and try to fix it. And I'll give you an example what this kind of studies can do um, in actually in one of my patients. She's a 60 years old female with multiple myeloma who actually was diagnosed in 2011. Um, again, for people less familiar with this, uh, uh, with this, the name of multiple myeloma, is a disease of the um, the blood. The cells normally, um, they when they become malignant, they produce a lot of protein, and this protein can unfortunately cause kidney problems, anemia, and lytic lesion. And specifically, she had a lot of lytic lesion, as you can see here. So this little spot in the bones. So what we know about myeloma, unfortunately, is still, we say, incurable. It's very aggressive. There is not really a cure, although um, the, all the treatment, all the technology are making the patient living longer. But nevertheless, it's a disease where we need a lot of attention because we need to learn more. And this is why probably in the first place is something that we are, we are very passionate about. We do a lot of research. But nevertheless, uh, uh, going back to this case, this patient was treated with a transplant that was, is still the standard of care for patients with multiple myeloma. But she didn't do too well because she actually had the disease coming back fairly quickly. And in few years, she really went from one line of therapy to the others without response. Six line of therapy, including immunotherapy, that again made the difference for some patients, not for her. So we were really close to quit. She was ready to quit and say, no, no, I don't want to try anything, nothing's working. But we convinced her to give her a sample and to investigate the genome to see really understand what went wrong in her specific case. 
And um, indeed, we, we collect the bone marrow aspirate, we extract the genetic material from the cells, and we perform the, the, uh, the sequencing. And what we found, analyzing our own cells at that time, that the air tumor cells express a gene, you don't have to remember the name, but it's a gene that actually was triggering the disease to proliferate so much because it's a gene that the cells, they use to really keep going, to grow, instead of being affected by the drugs. And this was explaining why air disease was really not under control with even the latest therapy. But, but why we got excited about this finding? Um, because we had a drug that can actually go after this gene. We have a drug called now Venetoclax, which is go, they go specifically after this target, and I'll show you the difference made on her life. So um, this is actually her, um, the last few years of treatment. You can see in the graph her monoclonal protein, which means um, is a way we, the, the monoclonal protein is used. We use for, we use in clinic to monitor the cancer specifically. And you can see between 2014 to 2016, this this uh, line was going up because her cancer protein was going up. So the disease was not under control. So she, she went really from drug A, B, a second trans but the disease was still not responding. It was really back in November 2016 when we made this discovery, we analyzed our tumor and we discovered this BCL2 of this, the cells expressed this gene and she went to venetoclax this drug. And you can really appreciate how the protein down came down and now more than three years, now almost three years, she's still in very good response, meaning her disease is still con under control. Again, a patient that was really ready to go to hospice in a way without option where this kind of work had discovered what was really the right therapy for her. Of course, I don't, have to sh I don't have time to show other examples, but we can all argue that this study can be, this kind of study can help us understand more about the, the biology of the disease, can identify target like the one I showed you earlier, can also tell us more about drug resistance that we know is a problem in patients with cancer. And although I have to say we are all excited, you can tell my passion about that too, there are still challenges. We have to face that. We know there is still a long way to go, uh, but because sometimes we have uh, uh, tumors that are very complex, where it is not easy to find only one target to go after. Maybe we have to combine other drugs. Second, sometimes we don't see the target or we don't have a drug for it. So we have to consider that to keep this in mind when we talk about this study. Nevertheless, I'm really, I really hope that I kind of mention, I communicate with you how this kind of work can really deliver what we call, we call precision medicine. We can really use this technology to really understand what is wrong in that tumor in a specific patient in a very individualized manner to really offer the best therapy and minimize the side effect. And this is really is the vision also of the Precision Oncology Hub that I have now the honor to lead in the, the tone maker. So now I'll pass on to uh, Doug, who will actually talk about the last uh, immunotherapy. Thank you for your attention. Uh, that was wonderful, uh, Darren and Paula. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Doug Mahoney. I'm a, a basic scientist, fundamental scientist at the um, at the Children's Hospital Research Institute and at the uh, at the Charbonneau Cancer Research Institute as well. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about um, the field of cancer immunotherapy, uh, which is uh, trying to target uh, a cancer by harnessing the power of your um, own immune system in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing uh, in the lab and a new initiative that we've, uh, we've started at the Charbonneau Institute that we're very excited about. So um, it's interesting. I often think, why, why don't we all have cancer? Why don't we have cancer all the time? So we've just heard about all of the different insults that we can get to our genomes. 
that can lead to mistakes and that these mistakes can, can lead to cancer. And we're in an environment where we're constantly being bombarded by potential uh, mutagens, so things that mutate our genomes. And, and I like to sort of put this in perspective a little bit with some numbers. So uh, our cells can make mistakes when they grow. Our cells are always growing inside of us. And uh, throughout the lifetime of each of us, it's predicted that uh, our, our, uh, we will undergo about 10 to the power of 16 cellular divisions. So that's 10 with 15 zeros at the end. And in each of those cells, there's three, th three billion base pairs, so those A, C, Gs, and Ts, the instructions for our genomes, three billion of those that need to be copied correctly, okay? And if mistakes in any of that happens, we can get cancer. So to me, that with, you know, with UV, uh, UV with uh, infectious diseases, with infectious agents, um, the question really is, wh why don't we all have cancer? And there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. Our bodies are, are clever. We've got some pretty sophisticated checks and balances that try and address these mistakes. And one of them is this right here. It's our immune system. So in blue, we've got immune cells, and in red, we've got cancer cells there. And this is just a, a pretty graphic image of an immune cell attacking and killing a cancer cell. Okay, and your immune system, for those um, who, aren't, who aren't super familiar, is that super complicated uh, system of cells and antibodies in your body, so T cells and B cells and natural killer cells in your body that are ultimately there uh, that evolved about a billion years ago to protect you from the outside world, okay? To protect you from things that aren't you. So from potential pathogens, things that might be dangerous to you. And your cancer cell, we've learned cancer comes from you. So it's not from the outside world. So your immune system doesn't normally want to attack you. That would be autoimmune disease. Um, but cancer mutates. And that's what causes cancer. So it can start to become a little bit different than you and just different enough that sometimes your immune system can see it as foreign and attack and kill it, okay? Well, why do we get cancer if we have such a sophisticated immune system and other checks and balances? Well, one of the reasons we get cancer is because cancer is also very clever and it can sometimes hack your immune system and trick it ultimately into not attacking it. So your immune system might see it as being a little bit different. It might try to attack it um, or want to attack it, but cancer can sometimes in very nefarious ways send signals to those immune cells to say, you know what, don't attack me, or I'm not actually cancer, so leave me alone, please, okay? And it can actually attack the genome ultimately of the, of the immune system to try and stay alive. The other thing that cancer does um, to, try and, uh, to try and prosper um, is to hide from your immune system. So your immune system has to see it as different. And cancer sometimes has some really interesting tricks uh, that it can use to ultimately try and conceal itself from the immune system. So you may not have seen that frog that was on the tree there. And this is what cancers can do as well. So I've pseudo-colored that with green just to illustrate that cancers can sometimes also camouflage themselves to try and uh, prevent being attacked by a predator, in this case, the immune system. So scientists um, uh, well before me started to recognize this, and um, they started to study this interaction between cancer and a patient's immune system, and they started to think about whether or not it was possible to try and help the immune system in a patient better attack and kill their cancer. And this became the field of cancer immunotherapy. And this is what we do um, uh, in the lab, and this is what uh, lots of others around the world do as well. Um, and this is just a, uh, I guess, a, a, a smattering of uh, newspaper articles and important science magazines to illustrate the importance of this field um, and the excitement around this field. It's being talked about in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, and in magazines like Science and Nature, important science magazines. Um, and people really uh, are starting to, uh, have started to get really excited, not only about the, the hope uh, around the prospects of harnessing your immune system, but the results that we're starting to see in human patients. And I'll give you, uh, a, 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 I guess, a, a larger overview through some fun facts and then an example of what has probably um, been so far the most successful cancer immunotherapy to date. So a couple fun facts. Um, first, cancer immunotherapy. So there was a, I, I didn't point it out, I should have pointed it out. There was uh, one of the journal articles there in Science that said, breakthrough of the year, 2013. Breakthrough of the year, okay? And sometimes we think of breakthroughs as being something that happens very quick, okay? Very, uh, like, a, like a eureka sort of moment. Okay, the first cancer immunotherapy was actually introduced in the United States in 1891. Okay, and it was a bacteria, cocktail of bacteria that doctors were injecting into tumors to ultimately try and stimulate the immune system in ways they had no idea uh, was working 
into attacking and killing the cancer. Okay, and it took until 2013 to, for, for this entire concept to be considered the breakthrough of the year in science. Number of FDA approved immunotherapy. So the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, it's like the Health Canada of the United States. Okay, there's, 20, there's more than 25 now. Who, who's heard of immunotherapy? Has everyone heard of immunotherapy prior to coming in? Okay, so most people have heard of it. Probably didn't know that there were more than 25 approved drugs in the United States now for um, more than 15 different cancer types. Okay, so it's now being, you know, these, these, this approach is now being widely used um, uh, across a lot of different cancer sites. Two folks have actually won the Nobel Prize, okay, for um, pioneering work they've done in this field, which is exciting for us. Uh, and for folks who are in the business community who like numbers, this is the estimated market value five years from now of cancer immunotherapy, $124 billion US worldwide. So this is a big deal. This is not just folks like me mucking around in the labs uh, anymore. This is something that's happening uh, in real life in a big way um, in our hospitals. So this is what really got everybody excited about cancer immunotherapy. We've been curing mice for quite some time in the lab. Mice are my patients, they're our patients. Um, but we hadn't been curing humans of their disease very well until um, this type of therapy right here. And this is called a checkpoint inhibitor. And this is the type of therapy, I, I told you earlier that, that cancer sometimes likes to hack the immune system, okay, and instruct the immune system not to attack it. Okay, and this is a type of therapy that ultimately was designed to block that hack, to prevent the cancer from hacking the immune system. So here's a cancer cell. And uh, cancer cells uh, have uh, barcodes on the outside of them, essentially, little, little sequences, little bits of their surface that can be recognized by an immune cell. So here's an immune cell, okay, and it recognizes a cancer cell um, with a barcode reader essentially. And if that barcode reader matches the barcode on that cell, uh, what is supposed to happen is that T cell or that immune cell will then essentially launch a series of missiles at that cancer cell and that cancer cell should die. So that's how your immune system is normally naturally trying to kill cancer cells that it sees as, as cancer. Now what about a cancer cell that's learned to hack? So here's our cancer cell, here's our T cell uh, doing its thing, uh, looking for a cancer cell, finding the cancer cell. Okay, barcode reader reads the barcode. Cancer, clever cancer, okay, it decides to send its own instructions to the immune system. And those instructions often are, don't release your missiles, don't kill me, okay? And then the cancer thrives. So uh, about 25 years ago, some really clever folks decided, well, maybe we can intercept those signals and block that hack. And again, you know, simplistically and schematically, uh, it looks like this, uh, recognition, uh, hack, block. So this is a drug. Um, there's a number of these drugs now that have been developed to ultimately um, block that signal from being received by the immune system. So that T cell then decides it will launch its missiles at this cancer and kill the cancer. Okay, so uh, a little perspective on where this type of therapy is right now. First FDA approval for this type of therapy was in 2011, so that's eight years ago. Okay, people have been working on it for about 20, 20 years prior to that. Eight years ago, first approval. Now there's six approved for use in the United States and in Canada as well. Generally speaking, Canadian approvals lag by six months or so. 14 cancer indications for this type of therapy now. Uh, it's estimated that about 43.5% of all cancer patients are eligible for this type of therapy. It doesn't work in all of them particularly well. It works in some of them. We're trying to figure out who that is and, and who it isn't. This is the overall response rate amongst all those 43.6%. So, so it seems low, 13%, okay? Uh, but a couple of things. These are folks who weren't going to respond or who hadn't responded to any other therapy, okay? So these were folks who were going to die. Um, the second thing is, is that 13% is across all 14 indications. Some indications, like melanoma, are really responsive to this type of therapy for reasons we're starting to learn. Um, those response rates, depending on which of these checkpoint inhibitors you give and how many of them you give, can be upwards of 30 or 40 or 50%. And then some of these other types of cancers aren't responding well at all. Okay, so this is a mix of all of them. Now here's an important number as well. There's over 1,500 cl ongoing clinical trials looking at um, who this works in, how to make it work better, how to combine it with existing chemotherapies or other therapies 
Um, and uh, every year there's new combinations or new checkpoint inhibitors that are coming, coming out that are making uh, response rates just a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So this is pretty exciting. Um, this is really exciting. So, uh, but what about those other types of, of cancers who aren't, um, who aren't hacking the immune system, but they're hiding from the immune system? These types of therapies don't work for those types of cancers because the immune system has to see those cancers. So what can we do in, in those situations? So I'm gonna tell you about a type of therapy that, uh, that we're working on, um, that groups around the world are working on. It's called engineered T cell therapy, and it's designed specifically to address those cancers that are naturally hiding from your own immune system. So here's a cancer cell, here's a T cell. T cell normally tries to see the cancer through its barcode reader, okay? What happens if cancer turns off its barcode reader, or deletes its barcode reader, or mutates its barcode, um, and, gets rid of, uh, and gets rid of that recognition? Okay, so uh, in that particular situation, the T cell isn't naturally able to see the cancer. Well, it turns out one of the things that we've learned over the years is that cancer has major barcodes, okay, that the T cell normally would recognize, and has a whole bunch of minor or smaller barcodes that the T cell in your body doesn't actually recognize particularly well, um, but there is the possibility to engineer recognition into that T cell using synthetic biology. So this is something that scientists have sort of devised over the last 20 years, 15 or 20 years, where um, uh, genetic information uh, can be delivered to those T cells and give them a new set of instructions, a different instruction. And that instruction can be a new barcode reader. Um, and that information is based on what we know about that particular cancer and what those minor barcodes look like so that we can engineer a barcode reader specifically to see that minor barcode, okay? And then when that happens, the hope is that, uh, again, that T cell will then attack and kill the cancer cell. Okay, uh, this is actually in the clinic um, uh, for certain blood cancers. And I just wanna give you a, a sort of a, an overview of how this therapy actually works in real life. So a patient comes in, if they're eligible for this therapy, blood is taken from this patient, so your immune cells are often, uh, can, be, can be taken from your blood, okay? And they end up in a lab like mine or a big manufacturing facility somewhere at a company um, where this genetic engineering happens, this synthetic biology. The new barcode reader is engineered into the T cell and then those T cells are grown and grown and grown and grown and grown in the lab until they um, are in the uh, sometimes tens of billions of copies, okay? And then two weeks later, thereabouts, they're injected back into that patient. And then the hope is that those T cells will then go find the cancer uh, recognize it through the new barcode reader um, and start to kill it and that it will grow in the patient. Those T cells will continue to grow in the patient, that they will persist in that patient for a long enough time so that they can continue to chip away at the cancer over time until all the cancer cells are killed. That's the, that's the idea. Um, this works um, for patients with certain types of blood cancer. So this is Emily Whitehead. Um, this was the first patient uh, ever, uh, first child ever, to be treated with this type of therapy. Um, and this was in 2011 at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. And she's alive eight years later with no evidence of disease. And again, all these types of experimental treatments, they only, they only get tested on patients who have exhausted all other options, so who were going to die. Um, and her life was saved. Um, uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, the, the, the data indicate, and these are early data because these, uh, you know, these are new therapies, but the data indicate in diseases like hers, um, for the patients who have exhausted all other options, upwards of 60 to 80% of those patients are actually responding completely to this type of therapy. So it's a game-changing therapy for this disease and for certain types of lymphoma as well. It's, it's remarkable. Um, everyone knows this guy. Um, it wouldn't have worked for his cancer right now. So uh, it doesn't work very well yet for patients who have solid tumors, so brain cancers or breast cancers or bone cancers like Terry Fox had or muscle cancers. And there's a bunch of reasons for that and we're starting to learn what those are. Um, it turns out that it's more difficult to figure out what those little barcodes are, the minor barcodes are, on the solid tumors than it was on the blood cancers. It turns out that the barcodes readers, the new ones, the synthetic ones that we built, are a little bit too primitive for all cancers, so there might need to be some, some new design. Um, 
often those cells which need to continue to grow in patients to clear the entire cancer, they don't grow enough in patients with solid tumors. They don't grow for long enough and persist long enough in patients with solid tumors. And sometimes when they get into a solid tumor, that environment, that microenvironment that Dr. Chan had an image of uh, early in the talk is really hostile to them. And they just, they stop working well um, uh, too, too quickly. So a lot of groups around the world uh, are, are chipping away at aspects of this problem, uh, and we are too. And we've recently started, uh, uh, I guess, a larger initiative in Alberta. We call it ACTION, so the Alberta Cellular Therapy and Immuno Oncology Initiative. And essentially, this is our team. This is Alberta. Uh, this is our team right here. Um, we are a bunch of basic scientists and immunologists and genomic scientists and computational scientists and oncologists and surgeons and hematologists. And essentially, uh, the mission of this program is ultimately to try and, um, try and develop uh, next generation, more effective, engineered cellular therapies for patients with certain types of solid tumors focused initially on brain cancer and sarcomas. Um, and the way that we're going to do that uh, is to uh, put, the, 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 put the right people uh, in place um, to help identify these, some of these minor barcodes on these types of cancers. Um, to build more sophisticated barcode readers um, using more sophisticated synthetic biology tools and a better understanding of why these things fail in certain, certain situations. To build more resilient T cells so that when they get into those hostile environments, they work better and for longer. Um, this is an interesting one. Sometimes, we, so we do all of our studies, as you'll see in a, in, a, in a little bit, we do all of our studies in animal models, in mouse models. Some of those models aren't perfectly representative of the human disease. We need better models. So to, um, to study these things in, in better, more representative mouse models, and then ultimately, of course, this is all directed at building new medicines that we can test uh, in clinical trials. So quick example um, of, of what we're doing. So um, making a more functional T cell, okay? So I told you that the way this therapy works is that a patient comes in, they get blood taken out, um, we, we, we purify those T cells, uh, we engineer them, we grow them up, we put them back in the patient. That's a two-week process, okay? And I told you that those T cells need to keep growing for this therapy to work. Um, and if they grow, the patient has a chance of surviving. Uh, and if they don't grow, the patient won't survive, okay? So that is a prerequisite. And I told you that in solid tumors, more often than not, those T cells don't grow. So the question is, how do we help make those T cells grow? And um, I show you this schematic. This is a schematic diagram of a virus, okay? Uh, when you guys think of viruses, you probably think of lots of different things. I was chuckling this morning, we were working together on this, and, uh, and Melissa um, actually disinfects her keyboard before handing it around to people because um, we're all so worried about viruses, right? Viruses normally cause infections, they can cause disease, okay? So that's what you think of when you think of virus. When I think of viruses, I think of actually opportunities because viruses are really, are really interesting um, and uh, there's a lot of possibilities with viruses. So all a virus is is genetic material. It's genetic material that's moving from uh, this thing here, okay, here is its genetic material, into you, usually for a short period of time, which often makes you a little bit sick, but not always, um, and then it's making more virus particles and it's going somewhere else, okay? So, uh, like most problems, um, our problem often is about communication and about flow of information. And with viruses, we have an opportunity to communicate to the immune system and to transmit information from us to it. And that's the way I see it. So, uh, this is just an example of uh, a little piece of information. Information, of course, as we, as, we, as we heard earlier, is all encoded in your genome. We can engineer the genomes of viruses, okay? So if we can engineer a piece of information into a virus, and a virus is a delivery vehicle of information to your immune system, well, it stands to reason that we can engineer information or transmit information, engineered information, to the immune system. And if that information is T cell grow, and we know what genes are needed to tell a T cell to grow, the question is, can we use these viruses to transmit that information? And this is one example of the types of, of, the types of approaches we're taking. So very, very quickly, uh, here's our patients, here's my patients. This is a mouse with a sarcoma, okay? And the experiment that we do is uh, we take blood out of that mouse, um, T cells out of that blood, we engineer them, we grow them up, we put them back into the mouse, and then uh, we do a little permutation. We either give it what I call a designer virus, 
to transmit the information that says T cell grow, or we don't give it that designer virus, and we ask the question, does it grow? How much does it grow? If it does grow, do they work? How well do they work? Or does it not work? And I'm going to show you one picture. Image is worth a thousand words. Here's one picture. And just to orient you here, this is, this is a sarcoma. This is a muscle, a muscle cancer. Okay, what you're looking at here is, is, is us looking through the microscope. And in blue, these are all the blood vessels in the tumor. You can't see the tumor cells here. These are all the blood vessels in the tumor. And in red, uh, these engineered T cells, okay, with the new barcode readers, uh, CAR T cells, they're called chimeric antigen receptors. Um, nine days after we injected uh, a million of these cells into this animal that had this tumor, and then went and looked in the tumor to see how many of these cells we could find, we could find one, at least in this, uh, this piece of the tumor right here, if we hadn't given a designer virus. And that recapitulates the problem in humans. These T cells don't grow, they peter off too quickly, okay? And this is what it looks like if you give the designer virus. And the designer virus, uh, remember, was, was, uh, was engineered to transmit one piece of information to those T cells, and that information was grow and keep growing, okay? And if you actually take the measurements here, there's five orders of magnitude more T cells on average in these tumors than there were in the tumors that didn't get the designer virus. So that's just one example of, of the types of uh, interesting, I think, creative ways that we're trying to address some of these important challenges to make T cell therapies work better for patients with solid cancers. Going forward, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think, you know, 10, 15, 25 years from now, I think increasingly we're gonna end up in a place where, uh, first of all, we, we should have less cancer because folks like Darren and others are going are to uh, are gonna teach us how to, how to take care of ourselves and how to prevent these cancers from, from, uh, from occurring in the first place and screen, do better screening for them. But for the cancers that we do have to deal with, I think um, more, more often than not, patients are going to go into a, a hospital and they're going to get a battery of genomic tests and highly defined molecular tests. And those things are going to inform uh, either the right combination of drug treatments, but increasingly, um, immunotherapies that are engineered specifically or quasi-specifically for the unique features of their tumor and their cancer. So with that, I'll say thank you very much.